Hi, I'm Josh Rushing, and you are now in the stream. Today, are violent video games turning kids into online soldiers? We examine the rising popularity of games like Call of Duty and what it means for underage kids who play them. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is back from a short break. Welcome back, Malika. Thanks, Hope you Josh. had a good time. Good to be here. Today we're talking about violent video games, particularly underage kids playing these games. What's the community saying about that? Well, we got a lot of feedback from people who actually play these games themselves, which, of course, is always very helpful, including this one uh, on Facebook. Jal says, killing or damaging virtual image enemies is an entirely different matter than hurting a real human being. Of course, that's explaining his position on Facebook. For those of you at home, we'd like you to do the same. Whether you play or don't play, weigh in on the conversation using the hashtag AJStream. To Malika's right is Christopher Ferguson, professor of psychology at Texas A&M International University. He conducts research on violent behavior, and much of his recent research has focused on positive and negative effects of playing violent video games. Christopher, thanks for being here. It's a real honor to be here. Great. And with us to share this conversation are four panel members. They're joining us via Google Plus Hangout, and we'll be getting to their comments and questions shortly. Now, if you want to be in our future Hangouts, go to the link below, add us to your circles, and keep an eye out for future topics that might interest you. Hi, my name is Thomas. I'm 22 and I'm from Belgium. I'm a young entrepreneur and I'm a young politician, and I'm in the stream. The Call of Duty game series is one of the most popular in today's video game industry. Since launching its first game in 2003, the franchise has earned more profit than Star Wars and Harry Potter films. Its latest game, titled Black Ops 2, set a new sales record for the franchise with $500 million in the first 24 hours alone. 16,000 shops around the world had midnight openings for the game's launch. During that same hour, Call of Duty was a top trending topic on Twitter in 23 different cities worldwide. And since the launch of its trailer less than a month ago on YouTube, it has gathered over 34 million views. Take a look at part of the trailer. Boom! Yeah. Come on, man! Surprise, boys! Surprise, horse lady! Not good. All right, we're going to talk about the content of the game a little bit later on, but I sure like the soundtrack. Now, these games are not made for people younger than 17 because of warnings like intense violence and strong language. But not everyone who's playing them is older than 17. An increasing number of minors are getting their hands on them. The games are very popular and a lot of kids want to play them too, but the only way they can get a copy is if their parents buy it for them. Now, at the store, the policy is the parents are given a warning about the contents of the game. If they accept, then the game's theirs. But what happens when underage kids play these games? And should there be tougher rules on underage gaming? To help us answer one of these questions, we are joined by Dr. Douglas Gentile, professor of psychology at Iowa State University. Dr. Gentile runs the Media Research Lab at Iowa State, where he studies the media's effect on children and adults. Douglas, welcome to the stream. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I'm going to throw the first question to you, and I want to pull up something for our viewers to see on my computer here. This is showing the global top sellers on video games worldwide, it's dated September uh, November 17th this year. Uh, I'm looking at the number one's Call of Duty Black Ops 2, number two is Call of Duty Black Ops 2 on a different platform. Out of the top ten, six of them are actually violent first-person shooter games. So, Professor Gentile, what does that really say about the gaming industry? Well, I think one of the things that it says is that the gaming industry knows when they've got a hit that they keep following it up with very similar things and we see that say in Hollywood that when there's one hit movie we see others that are very similar to it. Another is that the gaming industry recognizes that a lot of its profits are to be made not just on that initial release but over time and across many countries and a game that say relies on culturally specific types of content such as humor uh, won't do as well when you try to take it across cultures. But mm -hmm. violence is something that everyone understands. It translates very well into lots of languages. And so it's, in one respect, the easiest way for a company to make a lot of money is to make a violent game. So the audience is shaping the medium there. 
Uh, they're giving up. They're, they're making violent games because people want violent games. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the game Call of Duty or what it actually looks like, let's take a, a look at a clip here. From uh, this is from an in-game play mode, and it might give you a better sense of what the kids playing these games are actually seeing. Contested. Uh, Malika, what's the community saying about that? Well, our community is definitely weighing in here. Shuja Rabani says, I used to play violent video games, and they're good for relieving stress. Every generation, every generation Y has played Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. Um, mm -hmm. With that, I'd like to go to a gamer who's in our Google Plus Hangout. Uh, Patrick, speaking to us from Toronto, and Patrick, of course, is a gamer, and he's also a tech editor. Patrick, what's the lure of games like this? Uh, well, when it comes to games like Call of Duty, for me anyways, I, I don't really think the violence is the main draw. For me, it's sort of uh, the camaraderie and, and working together with other individuals to accomplish a goal. The, the violence is there, but it's not really the, the main point of the game and sort of what makes a lot of gamers want to play them. Well, in, in Call of Duty, someone's told me, and I, I have to admit I haven't played it, but that there's actually a mode where you can turn up the blood and the gore, the violence, and even the, I think, the language. Is, is, is that correct? And then or you can yeah. actually turn it turn it off. I, you can go either way with that, right? And so, like, how do you do? Do you play with this at full blood, at full full gore? What, what's the attraction of that? I, I'm not 100 percent sure how how the rating, um, the, the leveling works in the latest Call of Duty, but I know that you can you can turn down um, the option to to show less gore, to show more uh, to show more gore, and I think that option sort of just included um, for parents uh, that maybe are concerned about that sort of thing. For me personally, I, I just play it on um, whatever the main option is uh, that the game comes with. Um, and in regard to the main draw of that, uh, it, it's just sort of, it relates back to uh, the fact that in, in many ways, violence is entertaining. Um, it, it's, it makes the game interesting. Um, and, and there's a certain allure to take control of a character from a first person perspective um, and, and playing a game like that. So I want to ask you, because you're studying not only the negative, but the positive sure. impacts on this. I know the first-person games, there's actually something else going on as opposed mm -hmm. to a third-person game, right? I mean, you're really taking on the, the personification of the person you're playing. Right. You're seeing it from their point of view. How is this affecting particularly children who are playing these games? Uh, well, I mean, that's an issue, of course, that's been uh, a subject of a lot of debate in the scholarly community for you know, at least two decades uh, at, this time, at this point. And, uh, and, and quite honestly, the, the, no real conclusion has been reached. I mean, there certainly are some studies that suggest there may be some um, small impact on uh, aggression in people who play these games. Uh, there are other studies that suggest there is no effect, and there are even some studies that suggest that uh, playing these games may reduce aggression. Um, are you referring to the Canadian study where, where they, over four years, mm -hmm. with uh, I think hundreds, if not thousands of kids, they followed yeah. the reaction, and the kids who played the violent video games the most also recorded having kind of aggressive behaviors at school, increased aggressive behaviors at school? Right. This is the Brock University study, yeah. There, it was a longitudinal study. It was conducted with uh, you know, a large number of, of students, but uh, even the authors of that study, they, they point pointed out that uh, they weren't sure that it was necessarily the violent content of the video games that the kids were playing as opposed to the competitiveness mm -hmm. uh, of the, uh, the games they were playing. A lot of these games people can play head to head, others uh, they, uh, you can play cooperatively. And so in essence, uh, we may again be distracted somewhat by the violent content and focusing not enough perhaps on the way that people are playing these. Well, what are you seeing in terms of positive effects? The, the main thing that you get a lot of attention to with positive effects, particularly of first-person shooter types of games, are what's called visual spatial cognition. And visual spatial cognition is essentially your ability to rotate objects in your head or imagine objects in a 3D space. And it's the kind of skills that are useful for things like surgery, engineering, architecture, uh, you know, careers such as that. And there's, there's a fairly uh, wide body of literature at this point that suggests that individuals who play first-person shooter games are better at these kinds of tasks, mm -hmm. including surgeons. So in, in essence, mm -hmm. surgeons who play, you know, Call of Duty are better surgeons uh, for certain kinds of surgery uh, than are those that, uh, you know, don't play. Um, it seems like that would be true of any game that required a certain adroitness. I mean, uh, the, the, the killing, the blood, the gore, the war, 
I'm, I'm not sure you would need that to gain the, those types of positive effects. You would think so, but surprisingly not. I mean, they, they've actually done research on games like Tetris, which is you know, sort of an ideal, you know, kind of visual spatial type of uh, uh, you know, task game. And for whatever reason, you don't see those kinds of effects for Tetris. Mm -hmm. um, exactly why it is that you get these kinds of effects from first-person shooter games versus Tetris, nobody's really sure. Uh, I think most people would agree it's probably not the violence or the war that's necessarily going on that's doing it. But there's something about the specific type of gameplay, perhaps the need to make decisions very quickly that are visual spatial decisions that seem to be training these types of tasks. Well, I think Holly here on Twitter would agree with you, although she gives a, a nuanced view. She says, no video game violence can't translate into real life display of aggression. However, it can make people apathetic to tragedy and death. And Douglas, I want to direct this next one at you. Miriam says, my nine-year-old cousin Googled how to make a bomb for Call of Duty using his dad's phone and cops showed up for his father mm -hmm. after that. So would you admit that this stirs curiosity whether or not someone's actually going to go out and make a bomb? Well, I think that uh, Dr. Ferguson's exactly right that it's hard to make a direct link between playing a violent game and aggressive behavior. But one of the things we do know they do is they certainly can change what you think about, as is shown in your example here. They can change how you feel. They can change your physiology. And of course, how you think and feel does relate to how you behave, but not in any simple mechanistic way. And in fact, if games, if violent games didn't have any effect on us, we'd call them boring. <laughs> the fact that that we do get an adrenaline rush, that's actually an aggression effect. That is one of the effects of seeing something violent, is we do uh, drop glucocorticoids and catecholamines, you know, the so-called stress hormones, into our bloodstream in response to playing them. Can you talk to us about the research done in Singapore uh, with the kids there playing these types of games? Sure. Well, what uh, we're finding in Singapore, we are, we've been doing a large uh, longitudinal study of over 3,000 kids, followed them for three years. We're finding very similar things to what was found in Canada, that if the kids are playing more violent games, they do start to become more aggressive, they start thinking more aggressively, and they start being more willing to show aggressive behaviors. But uh, one of the positives that we find there is if they're playing pro-social games where they're helpful and cooperative with other players in the game, they then actually start having greater empathy for other people and showing more helpful and cooperative behaviors in the real world. And we've also been studying in that population what's being called video game addiction, uh, which is uh, not a term I really like, but uh, certainly seems to be something that people are very concerned about these days. We actually are joined by an avid gamer, uh, Ricard Edlin in the Google Plus, joining us from Munich today. Ricard, I, I want to ask you, how important is the violent aspect of these games? I mean, it can't be a coincidence that six of the top ten sellers in the world are all violent and first-person shooters. Yeah, yeah. hello. Uh, I wouldn't say that the violence is what attracts. It's more the fact that you're... You're fighting for your life. You have to keep your character alive, and I think that's that's like part of the excitement, really. That's, yeah. Well, then that's let's take it over to, to Patrick. Patrick, when we're looking at Call of Duty, right? Uh, as I understand it, there are actually scenes of torture in it. Um, clearly, there's blood, gore, a lot of killing, and I, as a guy who's been to war, I've been to war a, a lot of times in a, in a lot of countries and seen it. It's hard for me to imagine turning that in. To something fun. I, I mean, I kind of wonder where you draw the line. If torture is now part of a game, in the next game, what if rape was a part of it? They had a video game where rape was fun. Is, is something wrong with that? Um, in many ways, it's hard to defend the Call of Duty franchise. As an avid gamer, I'm not really a fan of it. It, it does a lot of things that are, are bad for gaming, and I think it gives it a bad rap. And in some ways, I think the developers are just simply trying to push the envelope and, and see what they can get away with. Um, there, there's other first-person shooters out there, like like Halo 4 and stuff like that, that sort of take the player on a more emotional journey that, that has violence in it, but also it's sort of a back cursor to, to the emotions between characters and stuff like that. Well, I want to get the view of a mother. We have two mothers in our Google Plus Hangout. Uh, Marla, Joe, I'd like to go to you. You're speaking to us from California. And I'll read you a tweet from Peter who says, Scientists do not seem to have much that proves video game aggression leads to real-life violence. Of course, our guest here today might refute that. As a parent, I say it does. And there's another from Garrett who says, This is unbelievably false. If kids can't make the distinction, it's your fault for how you raise them. Now, Marla, Joe, of course, you have two boys uh, who are under the age of seven 
19, if that's correct. What are you seeing? And do your kids play this? And, and, and is it difficult to restrict access to games like this? Well, first of all, my son's 15 years old, and you can definitely see the impact on him when he goes and plays these games because he comes home, he's spaced out, his eyes are glazed, and he's somewhat hostile for a while after he gets back. But one thing I want to say is that I was one of those naive moms that did not think my kid was playing these games because we don't have any of them in our house. But let me tell you, every single kid on this block has these games. My son knows every single thing about Call of Duty Black Ops. He knows every single thing about Grand Theft Auto. And it was shocking to me when I realized that he's playing these games all the time. So if you think your kid's not playing these games, you're probably wrong. I'm going to bring it back on yeah. set here. When you're looking at children playing these games, I, yeah. I don't buy the argument who, of people saying, look, if you can't make the distinction between killing on screen and killing in real life, then something's wrong with you or your parents, mm -hmm. because that's not what we're really asking. It, it's right. not about not being able to make the distinction. We're talking about these kind of subtle psychological effects. Right. Does it make a child a little more aggressive, or do, will it make them respond right. a different way in different scenarios? And, and let me ask you this. Have you seen any evidence that it affects or impacts younger children more than adults right. who are playing these kind of games? The, the short answer is basically no. Uh, that at, at present, it's very. I want to be very clear that increasingly some of the best studies that are coming out now, uh, including some from my own lab where we actually do track children over time and look at their bullying behaviors, dating violence, we've looked at violent crimes. We have not been able to find any link between violent video game playing and any of these kinds of aggressive behaviors in, in the real world. Um, another study that we recently did also suggested that, and this might be an important sort of take home message for a lot of parents I think, is that uh, we looked at kids who played violent video games with their parents and we found that people that played or kids that played these games with their parents actually had the best outcomes. They actually were more civically involved, engaged in more pro-social behaviors uh, than kids who either played alone or didn't play it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we're talking about like, you, you know, one concern I have is when we're talking about violent games versus pro-social games, we have to remember that a lot of violent games have pro-social themes in them and it's not really possible to distinguish between a violent game and a pro-social game in a kind of dichotomy. Uh, such as we tend to do, and, and games such as Call of Duty probably fall within that. Well, uh, yeah, you got to put this in layman's terms. Sure. Pro, pro social. Pro social yeah. means that you're trying to help others out. You're you're cooperating in some sort of way. Or you're saving other individuals. And a lot of games, just like a lot of fairy tales or movies or television shows, will have violence in them. But they'll also have these kinds of themes about helping others, about doing the right thing, about saving others in need, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. So I think we've, to some extent, gotten into this uh, discussion of trying to make games either violent or pro social. But really, that's not the case. Uh, and a lot of violent games, uh, as some of the commenters mentioned, do have some uh, artistic you know, qualities or redeeming qualities, perhaps. And I, I haven't played the most recent Call of Duty, the Black Ops 2, but I have played the first one. And, uh, and you were actually referencing the issue of, of torture, you know, for instance. And uh, the initial Black Ops actually had torture as well, but it didn't glorify it. In fact, it was part of the tension uh, of the story to a great degree. And, and uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie of Apocalypse Now, for instance. Sure. Uh, and in some ways, Black Ops had a storyline and an approach to war that was very similar to Apocalypse Now. Hmm. And a lot of these games, I think we get in the, in the mindset of thinking about them as like Pac-Man or, or Centipede, very simplistic uh, kinds of games. And we lose track of the fact that these tend to be very sophisticated stories uh, that are now being portrayed. But, uh, but kind of bringing it back, I mean, there, you know, there are certainly studies that do go back and forth on this issue, but the overall picture is that uh, the impact on real world aggression seems to be very, very minimal. Sure. Uh, it's important to point out that, you know, kids have been exposed to these types of games for now probably about two decades, mm -hmm. uh, and youth violence is at its lowest level in 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, and bullying is down. I think that down. the part that you just said, we've been exposed to this for about two decades, there's some <laughs> social commentary yeah. from Ali Latifi on Twitter who says, culturally, how did we get to the point where the biggest games went from Mario and Sonic to constant stream of first-person shooters? Well, let's all just weigh, uh, ponder that for a moment, but I'd like to go back to our Google Plus Hangout to speak to another mother, Andrea, speaking to us from Long Island. She's a blogger and of the mother of uh, gamers. Andrea, there's a tweet here from Juan who says, it depends on the child's nature and their family environment. This, of course, is getting back to the role of parents. Games alone don't produce violent people. Your thoughts? I agree with that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there, we talk a lot about the games that my kids play. Um, we keep the console in the living room. I'm vaguely aware of everything that's going on uh, with the games that they play. 
so I can ask them questions and kind of uh, then bring the game into other conversations that we have. Uh, you know, just the other day, my son was looking at an image on Facebook of a soldier that was burned, and he said, I don't like seeing that when I go on Facebook. And I said, you know, I think you need to think about that in terms of a, co a potential consequence of some of these first-person shooter games. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's all part of the same package. And if you don't like seeing that, then I think that's something you should consider when you're playing the game. Just, you know, we keep these conversations going. Uh, it's There's nothing perfect. It's an ongoing uh you know, conversation. Professor Gentile, what does it say, I, I mean, I, a lot of what we're talking about is the impact on the individual of these games, but I'm also kind of wondering on a broader societal perspective, what happens to, this, to the society and, when, and what are the long-term effects when you have tens of millions of people playing these kind of games? What does it mean 10 years from now when the U.S. is considering going to a war or not and how its constituency views that war when they have this kind of background with these type of games? Is anyone looking at the long-term societal effects of these games? And I should mention, this is in a society where these types of games, first-person shooter games, are literally dwarfing what's coming out of Hollywood or television. Um, these are some of the largest entertainment events of the year now when a game like Black Ops 2 comes out? Well, there certainly are some people who believe that uh, perhaps there's even a conspiracy theory kind of thing happening where the, the military industrial complex wants the entire country militarized so that then we are more willing to go to war. I don't tend to buy into types of arguments, but perhaps that's because I, I'm a child psychologist and I focus really on what the individual effects are. And I think, you know, going back to some of the excellent points that have been made here, you know, one of the reasons Dr. Ferguson and I tend to disagree on how seriously we should take the connection between violent games and aggressive behavior is what level of aggression we're talking about. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist more interested in the extremes, you know, truly violent and criminal behavior. I'm a child psychologist. I care more about types of aggression that happen on the playground, such mm -hmm. as name calling or teasing uh, or perhaps even at its extreme hitting. And in the types of studies that look at that level, that's where we tend to see more of an effect. Hey, Professor Gentile, I'm going to stop you there because we're going to go to Leeds with Malinka. So hold that thought. We will pick up right there when we go to the post show. In fact, I want to bring in what you brought in, the U.S. military and how they're involved when creating some of these games and how weapons are now shaped by some of these games. Uh, but before that, let's go to Malinka. She's back. And uh, let's see some other leads that we're following. The Israeli army spokesman who runs the mil military social media presence is now at the center of his own online controversy after being accused of posing in blackface. Sasha Dratwa, head of the new media desk, is known for his nearly entirely public Facebook profile. Public, that is, until someone dug up this photo from his timeline. Dratwa titled the September picture of himself with mud spread over his face as Obama style, prompting some netizens to call racism, as you can see in this tweet. Well, Dradwa has responded on his Facebook page saying he is not racist and announcing that he's now restricting access to his profile. Our next leads from India, where the chief minister of Gujarat has turned himself into a hologram. A 3D image of Narendra Modi addressed tens of thousands of people at rallies last week as part of his re-election campaign. He began the appearance, which was also streamed live online, by telling the crowd they were witnessing a first ever event. And lastly, we're following the angry online reaction to an electronic system that tracks women's cross-border movements in Saudi Arabia. Your wife has just left the country. Saudi Arabia implements SMS tracking system, Glenn tweets, adding, this should make you all uncomfy. Women had previously needed permission to leave the country, but now male guardians receive an automatic text message informing them when women under their custody leave. And though Saudi Arabia isn't the only Gulf country where the guardianship system exists, the high-tech update has web users outraged. Hey Cal sums it up, new technology to preserve old ways. We want to hear from you. Let us know what you think of those stories by tweeting us with hashtag AJStream. Josh? Hey, thanks Malika. Join us in the online post show at stream.outzera.com. Until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back to the online post show. We're going to pick up right where we left off. In the leads there, at the end, the, the Indian politician with the hologram, and he mm -hmm. said that was the first. Didn't Tupac already do that? He did, but this is the first politician. Oh, uh, the first politician yes, to exactly. do it. Uh, yes. That's not nearly as cool. Tupac did. Beat me All too. right. Uh, hey, Marla, Marla Joe Fisher, are you still there in the, the Google Plus Hangout? Yes, I am. Great. I wanted to ask you what you think about a connection between the U.S. military and the video game industry. Well, let me just tell you, there is a recruiting center, a U.S. Army recruiting center about a mile from my house, and they have a full video arcade then there where kids can come and play these kind of violent games. I'm not sure what the age limit is on it, but I'm not anti-military. My father was a military man, but you have to ask yourself um, if the Army itself is not encouraging kids to make this leap from, you know, aggression on the screen to aggression in real life. Yeah, well, I think that's a fair question, and in full disclosure, I should probably say that uh, I used to be in the U.S. Marine Corps, and one of my last jobs was representing the Marines in Hollywood, which generally deals with uh, loaning tanks, planes, or even Marines or bases to television shows or movies mm -hmm. as a way of educating the American public about mm -hmm. the role of the U.S. military and what they do. But as I, w I was leaving that office in about 2004, um, and I came down to there in 2005, one of our, our main people we were working with was, was, I believe, EA at the time mm -hmm. that was making some kind of military game. And they wanted military support. They wanted right. to actually film mortars exploding and the voices of uh, Marines and training and you know all these kind of things to make their games more realistic. And, and at the time, and I believe this is still the policy of the U.S. military, it was to support those kind of efforts because it's... It, on the surface, the military will say because it's a, it's an educational tool. Right. So many people play them, and the, what they think about the U.S. military is being shaped by these games. But the real truth of it was, it's such a recruiting tool mm -hmm. um, that they want to protect their brand right. essentially within these games. And even now, I know because I've, I've done other stories, weapons are being designed based on gaming controllers. So PS3 controllers are now used to control small drones mm -hmm. at the at the at the squad level. Is there any ethical issue in your mind to worry about where to draw the line? with U.S. military's involvement in these kind of video games and, and our children. Sure. Well, I mean, the U.S. military actually has its own game, America's Army, which they, they do use more or less as a recruiting tool. Huh. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, whether they would say it outright or not, I think the military would certainly like this to be true. Mm -hmm. um, wh whether it is or not is, is perhaps somewhat debatable in the, in the, to the extent that uh, even though the military has had America's Army out and, you know, of course, there have been all these first-person shooter games, uh, my understanding is that the military is still continuing to have a very difficult time recruiting people and of course probably there being the, the wars ongoing were part of that mm -hmm. um, but whether individuals I mean a lot of what we're talking about is do individuals make the jump from a fictional video game to um, real life and and the answer again seems to be for the most part no that people seem to be able including children seem to be able to distinguish what goes on in the fictional universe from the, the real world universe. Well, let me jump in right here just for yeah, a second. Sure. Did you ever read uh, Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card? I can't say I have, no. Okay, it, it, it's a book about this for kids, and I don't want to give away too much. They believe they're playing a game, but it ends yeah. up being something else. Mm -hmm. um, but as we, as drones now, mm -hmm. you are now taking lethal action from so far away right, with right. a joystick. You're looking at a screen. That's moving to land-based robots as well, right. where I will be able to control a robot in some country like Afghanistan, even though I'm sitting in Las Vegas. Right. And with a controller, I'll be able to fire, fire a shotgun if I want to. Right. And I'm wondering, at, at some point, it's almost like the convergence of humans and, and, and people. At some point, will you not be able to distinguish between real killing and video game killing? Right. At present, I mean, obviously there hasn't been a lot of research looking at that from the soldier's perspective and, you know, and seeing do these people who are, for instance, uh, controlling drones or, or robots, do they have a different reaction to a combat scenario than to someone who's right up in there and right. in front of it? Right. Um, you know, all I can, I can say is, again, from the opposite side, from just from the home use perspective, uh -huh. you know, when we look at people, for instance, we did a study recently looking at, uh, uh, it's more like television in this case and video games, but we looked at the extent to which, you know, watching violent scenes that were fictional, how much did that impact people's empathy when they had then watched scenes of actual people getting hurt or, hmm. or injured? Uh, and interestingly enough, there was no impact. Uh, that being exposed to violence in fictional media did not have an impact on people's empathy uh, to a real-world scenario. It sounds like what Andrea was saying in mm -hmm. the Google Plus yeah. Hangout, right? That her child plays these games, but then saw a real picture on Facebook and was 
still empathetic right. based on the real picture. Our, our brains seem to be able to understand the difference between what we're seeing you know, in a fictional universe and, than, than a real one. I mean, once you're getting into these kind of military scenarios where you're saying there's kind of some sort of blending of that there, that, that honestly hasn't been researched to a great degree at this point. And I think you'd have to do some research with simulations with actual For some doctoral know, student uh, warfighter. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> well, we're talking about the intersection between real life, in this case, the military and yeah. games. Oregano and Olive Oil Yasertina on Twitter says, video games account for a small amount of militarization that you would face. Violence is glorified in every aspect of modern society. And Douglas on Skype, I want to go to you for this next one. Uh, Alan says, people just look for something to blame on behavior in society. It used to be rap music, but now we're blaming video games. And of course, after every school shooting, someone turns to video games or, or rap music or something to place the blame on. Is that all this is? Well, part of it is that, uh, that once there's some tragedy, we enter what I call a culprit mentality, where we look for the cause. Mm -hmm. And the problem with aggression is it's multi-causal. There are over a hundred known risk factors for aggression. Media violence is just one of them. It's not the biggest, but it's also not the smallest. It's just right in there with the rest. And the only way anyone does something seriously violent is if they have multiple risk factors and very few protective factors. And thankfully, most of our kids have a bunch of protective factors, which means that they can consume a lot of violent video games and they're still never going to do anything seriously violent. But that's a different question from does it have any effect? It's certainly having an effect, as we've heard from the moms, that you can tell right away after playing it that it has an effect on you. Otherwise, you wouldn't really like it. It'd be boring to you. D Doug and I do agree on, you know, to the extent that, uh, you know, violence certainly is multi-determined. Where, where we disagree is whether media violence is one of those risk factors or not. Now, wait, do you disagree when you say media? Because when you say media violence, you're not just talking video right. games. Like, how prevalent is violent in, uh, violence in, in a child's world? Uh, going back as far as the Greeks, really. I mean, it's, it, violence has been part of entertainment as far as recorded history goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the Greek plays, talking about fairy tales, uh, you know, certainly the Bible and other religious texts have a great degree of violence in them. Um, so, I mean, violence really is a part of the landscape of what children are exposed to, not just in video games or television, but also in just the, the way the culture raises them. And, that, and that's been part of the landscape, really, as long as there have been children. Mm, part of the landscape, Christopher agrees. He says, this leads to violence as much as any other media, like books or movies. It shouldn't be singled out, in my opinion. But I'd like to go to Google+. Plus. Patrick, I have a follow-up question for you. This is a, a, a comment left on our Google+, Plus page from Leslie, who says, after playing, you start looking around corners for people hiding, and even your house will look more ominous at night. And when you see a car, you feel an urge to lob a grenade. It definitely rewires your brain. Now, uh, if I understand correctly, you, uh, you play Halo, not necessarily Call of Duty, but do you get this same type of feeling? Are you you're more heightened sense of awareness? Um, <laughs> definitely not. Um, to, for me, this is a, a very, very clear line between uh, video games and reality and going to work every day and, and stuff like that. And for me, gaming's always been um, sort of a stress reliever, to a hobby, uh, something that I'm passionate about that, that I do in my free time. Um, if I played a first person shooter for a few hours and then went out to go to the grocery store, I wouldn't be uh, sneaking around aisles and, and, and stuff like that. Hey, I'm curious, Malika, as I've listened to some of the tweets you brought up, it seems like, is, is our community landing firmly on the side of, this isn't a problem, leave it alone? <laughs> it sounds like it, and I think a lot of them are gamers, so <laughs> do, <laughs> bias do you think results there's a correlation <laughs> yeah, between might be, the two? Might be. <laughs> well, that's kind of an important point, you know, that we have this history in our society of whenever new media comes out, we tend to go through the same pattern. I mean, you know, for instance, 50 years ago, uh, with comic books, we had psychiatrists going up in front of Congress saying that comic books not only cause juvenile delinquency, but homosexuality, because apparently Batman and Robin were secretly gay. Right. Uh, and at the time period, where you have usually older adults who are not using the new media, mm -hmm. you oftentimes see these kind of panics evolve uh, around them. And it's usually after two or three decades. Okay, look, we're going to wrap yeah. up. I want to ask you, do, do you have any sensitivity to the younger kids actually playing Black Ops to a game like that? I, I, I think like it's... If you had a son seven years old, eight years old, would you not want him to see some of the stuff in there? Uh, we're actually fairly permissive in our family in terms of, because again, we don't see any evidence in the research suggesting there's much to worry about. Um, you know, I, I would advise families to make an informed decision, to pay attention to the ESUB ratings, and to read reviews of the games and make a, an informed decision for themselves. All right. I want to thank our guests today, uh, Christopher, Douglas. Um, also, thanks for our Google Plus Hangout, everyone there. On Tuesday, No Women Allowed, the Church of England's recent vote not to ordain female bishops has many questioning if the church 
has fallen behind the times. Send us your thoughts on that. Until then, we'll see you online.